you're good okay hello everyone welcome and thank you for coming to join us today um today we have dr goodman and we're going to be having a q a session where we're begin getting to know him and asking him a lot of questions um so yeah feel free to introduce yourself briefly um and we can get started Cool. I really appreciate you having me, Gene, your whole crew. I think it's awesome that you guys are learning about what it's like to be in dental school. So I am a 44-year-old. I graduated from dental school in 2002. I currently work in New Jersey with my brother. Two general, We have two practices. We have eight dentists working with us, so I'm super into collaboration. Um, dentistry can be a lonely profession by yourself, so I really like having other dentists on site. I also have started a few companies and groups. One is Dental Nacho. You see this? I never can point, right? This behind me over here. Uh, that's my Facebook community, Instagram community, designed to help bond dentists together, learn about the industry, become friends, learn about the things they don't teach you in dental school. And then my other thing over here, Dentist Job Connect. Uh, one of the things that dental school does not do well is to prepare you for life after dental school, like getting a job. So I've created a world where we can bond practice owners and new dentists together, uh, DSOs and dentists. I live in Center City, Philadelphia. I have an awesome family, a wife and two daughters that are uh, mostly awesome and also mostly energetic and chaotic. So uh, I do that, we're getting a dog soon. So this week actually for my daughters, so they're, they're excited for that. So just be, I'm here to share and love um, answering questions about our profession and glad to be here. Amazing, thank you so much for that introduction. So yeah, so one of the first questions is, how did you decide that you wanted to become a dentist? What interested you in dentistry? So growing up, I wanted to be a professional NBA basketball player, and that dream failed miserably. So, you know, you can't always achieve your dreams, especially only grow to five foot nine or 10. So I grew up in New Jersey in the 90s. So a lot of people in New Jersey in the 90s thought of being a doctor, dentist, or lawyer. So I like George Clooney from A Few Good Men, uh, George Clooney from ER, which was a medical show. I like the movie A Few Good Men, a lawyer or a dentist like my dad. One of the things that inspired me to become a dentist is I really wanted to working in a business environment where I had control, so I got to be my own boss. I liked helping people. I, even though I grew up in a dental practice and grew up working at my dad's office and all these different jobs, I still really didn't know what it was like to be a dentist until I became one. So if I can just add value as I go along, it's a huge decision to become a dentist. I would research it by asking dentists where you live, could you observe them for the day? And don't just observe what happens inside the operatory, fillings and crowns and extractions, but observe what they have to do outside the operatory. You have to answer a lot of questions. You have to run a team. So your personality must be one where you like that. You like fast paced stuff. You like sometimes organized chaos. You do get to help people, but I'll share with you authentically. I think one of the reasons that Dental Nachos is so successful is because I've created a dialogue for people to talk about things that they don't like about being a dentist. I think if a lot of people knew what it was like to be a dentist, they might have chosen a different career without judgment. So I think really observe in dental offices, ask as many people as you can about being a dentist, because it is a full, fully intense career that can be awesome, but it also can be very annoying to deal with insurance, deal with patients, have to deal with people who don't want to be there. So I'm really glad that I became a dentist, but you're also looking at somebody on my walking treadmill. I probably would have been satisfied to do like 10 different careers. If I was an accountant, I probably would be happy. If I was a business person, I'd be happy. So just make sure when you choose dentistry that you know exactly what you're going into, which is super hard because they don't let you do a practice filling, Janine, on a random person to see how it is. So the best advice I could give is observe in different dental offices. Go to the front desk, say, I'm interested in coming to dentist. Can I observe here? But people do that in my office. It's a great way to get insight into the field. You're awesome. And going back to your years in undergrad, can you explain like what extracurricular activities you did during undergrad and any like programs such as summer programs you might have been part of or just something in general to related to extracurricular? That's a really good question. A lot of people ask me that. I did the seven year dental program. So in some ways I had some advantages that I wasn't as concerned about that. I liked going to Villanova. If anybody wants to reach out to me at pauldentalnachos.com or on Instagram, I can ask other people who are in the application process. I think doing things that show you like helping people, being involved in a team, doing stuff behind besides school, I've interviewed for our general practice residency program are all really good things to do to make you a well-rounded applicant. Okay, sounds good. 
And so you mentioned that you were part of the seven year program. So do you think that that may have set you apart from others or what in general did you do during school that also might have set you apart? I mean, the seven year programs are unique because if you kind of check all the boxes, you automatically get into dental school. I think what might set people apart for dental school applications would be really showing that you bring something to the school that they value, whether that's, um, doesn't mean you have to be a researcher, but just that you show enthusiasm, that you wanna be in the profession. I think my hope is, I don't, uh, I don't, no one's ever asked me to do dental school interviews, but what I would think is important is to talk like you know the field. Oh, I observed at my childhood dentist office, I see that dental insurance is a big part of what we do, but you still try to help patients. Or I've observed an orthodontist office, I've worked there for the summer, I think showing that you have some industry specific knowledge would make you a good candidate. Okay. And you kind of mentioned this a bit about shadowing, but what do you recommend is the best way to ask a dentist for shadowing, such as okay, do you think calling, going in person, emailing, what do you prefer? So what I say is I'm a very kindly annoying person. I kindly annoy people and have good ideas. So one would be to call, it would be multiple ways of connection. Call the front desk. If you call my office right now, 609-737-0288, say, I'm listening to Dr. Nacho talk to us. Dr. Paul, he said that I should observe at offices. I would like to set up a time to observe at your office. Um, who would be the best person to talk to? Sometimes it's the dentist, sometimes it's the office manager. So I would do calling, I would email, and sometimes I would just show up, wear like professional clothes, say I'm interested in dentistry, go to 10 offices, seven might say we don't wanna do it, but if that one magic office says sure, maybe you get a job out of it, maybe you get to meet a new dentist in the field. So it's really going to as many offices as possible, connecting with as many, so shoot for 10, ask 10 offices, visit 10 offices, call 10 offices, email 10 offices, and I think something good will happen. Okay. And then do you have suggestions for what a student can do during shadowing to make the most of the experience? I mean, show interest and engagement, all the things that happen, not just the dental part on the patient, but also how they interact with their team. And this is the best question you can ask for dentists. And this, here's the thing. If you want to go to a restaurant for your birthday, and you really like this restaurant, and you ask someone and go, how is ABC restaurant? And they say it's good, you stop asking, right? Because you say, oh, I want to go. So ask 10 dentists of different ages, would they pick being a dentist again? During shadowing, if you would say to the eight dentists that work in our office, if you were applying to dental school again, would you do this again? What would you do different? You might hear, this is a perfect career for me. I'm glad I did it. You might hear, I wish I worked at a desk job. You might hear, I wish I worked remotely. So ask as many dentists as possible without judgment. Hey, I know you like being a dentist. Would you do it again? Would you be a specialist? Like if I went back and did it again, I would most definitely be a periodontist, not a general dentist. I would have chosen a specialty program for me instead of general dentistry. I'm glad I do what I do. I'm glad I run multiple practices, but I would have done something different. I would have chosen a specialty instead of general dentistry. Okay. And then related more into the application side, um, when did you start on your personal statement and how did you come up with ideas for what to write about? So I, someone just asked me, a fourth year dental student said, I wanna make a resume to apply for a job. So storytelling is really great. So Google how to tell a good story, how to write a good story. This is really valuable. If I can give you, if you said there's one thing you could do from this meeting from me, I would say, do this, write this down, put this in the chat, go to YouTube, and Google how to speak by Patrick Winston, W-I-N-S-T-O-N. It's an amazing MIT lecture on how to get a job after college, how to present yourself. So what I would do in my personal statement is really to focus on stories, telling them in a way that inspires, that shares my background. They don't have to be the most dramatic stories of your life, but I would really work on your personal tip statement telling a really the story of you in an authentic and genuine way, which is hard to do unless you get some really good training on it. So most definitely watch How to Speak by Patrick Winston. Okay, that's a good recommendation. And then do you think there are certain things that people should stay away from when writing about the personal statement in regards to, for example, how formal or informal some things should be? Um, I mean, again, I'm someone who's interviewed for GPR programs to help with that, not dental schools. I would just make sure that, you know, it reflects who you are well with, you know, good grammar, you know, maybe have someone read it over, you know, invest in that. I think that 
if you be overly judgmental, of, is this good? Make it something that you're proud to share about yourself. Make it something that, you know, it's really you. So you can't go wrong with, I say to my team on Facebook, you know, just be you, JBY, just be you. But, you know, also it might be well worth it to take a course on personal statement writing or, or watch some YouTube videos because maybe there's some tips and tricks like what do you start with, right? You know, how do you how do you end it? So I would say that I would there's nothing I would stay away from as long as you're your authentic you. Okay. And then speaking more on the test side, so when did you take your DAT? Like what year of school did you take it in? And how did you best prepare for it? So really good questions. I was wanting to do well, so I took a DAT prep course. I mean, this was you guys were maybe not born during this time, probably make me feel old if I tell you, you know, maybe some of you were 1999, so I'm not that old. I didn't, you know, but I took a DAT prep course and I tried to do get a good score. I knew I had to get above a certain score, but I didn't have as much pressure because I was in the seven year program. I think my DAT scores, I, what is this, what is the ranges for scores now? I think it depends. Uh, most schools are looking for about 20 to 23. Like yeah, I think I want to say my score was a 21. I don't remember exactly, but um, I would strive to do your best on that. But I really don't, I really don't like standardized texting. I don't think it's texting. I don't think it really is reflective, but I know it's part of the game you have to play. Um, one of the things, I mean, I love being here and I'm really helpful as possible, but you are talking to like a 44 year old that went to dental school 20 years ago. So if you connect with me, I can put, post any questions on my 38,000 member Facebook group, because maybe there's someone who's doing a prep course right now, Janine, that would really know this answer better than me. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. And for schools, how did you prepare for interviews? I mean, in general, so one of my patients, Mark Dorio, wrote the Idiot's Guide to the Perfect Job Interview. So I would get the Idiot's Guide to the Perfect Job Interview online or a book. Interviews have nothing to do with dentistry and everything to do with being able to succinctly talk about yourself in an inspiring way. So I would definitely take, read an interview book, and I would prepare for every interview about researching the, the place and the person. So if you're going to interview at Penn Dental School, while it would be really cool to say, I knew Penn Dental School was started in 1850. I don't know when it was started. What would be extra awesome to say, I researched this area. Not only is this a great dental school, I see there's an awesome restaurant scene in Philadelphia and there's a lot of museums and I like that. So show that you're also looking at things besides just the school, that you're looking at real person stuff too. Okay, so do you, did you also look up for example, the people who would be interviewing you and get to know them, or was it mainly about that school aspect? So what would be really cool for you guys to understand as younger people than me, that wasn't even invented when I interviewed. So we would just walk in and we wouldn't know who was going to interview us. But I think that's a great tip. So if you do know the interviewer is the head of the restorative department, for sure look up and say, oh, I saw that you teach on all ceramic crowns. That sounds really interesting. People love talking about themselves. So if you can show that you've looked into that, I think that's a huge leg up. I just said, when I interviewed, there was like, we just went and there was no, I, I know this is hard to understand, but we had to use the internet at a computer lab. That was a real story back then. So my ability to get that information, Gene, was really a lot different than what you guys have now. I see, so, yeah. And then do you happen to remember any questions that might have stood out to you during any school interview? It, you know, when we went, I was in a group interview with the seven year program, so it wasn't like really drilling us on these specific things. I'm sure that that would be, I would be glad to ask that question on my group and say, what have been some interview questions you guys have been asked? I don't know what the up to date ones are for dental schools, but I think if even if you looked up common interview questions, I'm sure they'll do that. You know, the, even as much as the where do you see yourself in five year type things you would want to know, but then there might be some very dental specific questions. Um, that my group could help you guys with. Did you guys interview? I can get you also, Janine. I mean, I'm happy to share as much. I have a lot of contact with people who are like two years out of dental school. So I'm sure that they remember that a lot better than I did. Okay. And then when you were in school, how did you go about getting letters of recommendation? I mean, I, I've had to do that many times in my life. So really, mm -hmm. it's people, I've developed relationships with people for the right reasons. Get to know them as people. So when they're writing your letters of recommendation, they know what to say about you besides just, you know, Janine is a bright young student. It's like, I know Janine, she always comes in with a coffee and brings one for me and she's great to talk to. So it's really about developing relationships and then asking people if they're comfortable with writing you one. And I did that through dental school with my professors and college and things like that. 
So it's just developing relationships for the right reasons so that when it comes time to asking for a recommendation, they feel comfortable giving you one. And then if you don't mind us asking, how many schools did you end up applying to? So for me, it was really only Penn because I was in that, oh. you know, the Penn program. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that most of the people in Del Nato's, you know, apply to four to eight schools. Okay. But um, that's just my sense from reading the group of the people who are applying now. So I wouldn't just say I have my heart set on going to Harvard. That's the only one because the, what, the reason people get into schools is just can be all over the place. You guys are all such bright, smart, talented people, and it's easy to feel disappointed if the place you want to go doesn't pick you. So that's why make sure you give yourself as many options as possible. Yeah, so you mentioned that you've seen people apply to about four or eight. What do you think is like a good number to apply to? Like, should this be around that range or a little higher? I mean, right now I know dental schools are more competitive than when I went. So it would be something I would ask. I feel like going on more than eight interviews might be like a lot of work, but I don't know if that's just the norm now. So I don't want to give you, I don't want to mislead any of you awesome young pre dents and tell you four. And then my group say four, I applied to 14 schools. So I could, you know, be glad to tag me in an Instagram post with a poll. How many schools did you apply to? And I'll tag people to do it. But that's my sense is probably in that range. Um, yeah, that makes sense. And then you mentioned that you have been in this program. So with that, were you able to take a gap year or were, did you just go straight into that? I went straight through. Part of me likes that. Part of me wished I had a gap year. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's pros and cons to both. But I was like, I graduated dental school when I was 24. So I was pretty young. Oh, so I was like the youngest kid in my class growing up. So uh, if you have the chance to take a gap year, I think you should enjoy it. I did not get that chance. Maybe I can take a gap adult year. You think they offer that, Janine? Can I just take a year off from 46 to 47? Why don't they offer that? <laughs> and then if for somebody who does take a gap year, what do you recommend that they should do during that time? I mean, I think you, it depends on your total. If you're taking a gap year because you're just trying to take a break from school, maybe anything. If you're trying to make your resume look better for dental school, maybe something in the biology field or working for a company that does that. I, these are just things I would do as a person myself. I don't know what they look most favorably on. You know, if you take a gap year in our server at a restaurant, that sounds good to me, but I don't know if maybe that's the strongest thing for your application. I think it would be your intention of the gap year. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people do do like, for example, dental assisting or they continue shadowing during that time. I mean, I think it's great because if you work in the industry, you're really going to want to know if you want to go to dental school or not. Mm -hmm, exactly. So you mentioned that you went to Penn, so that's where you went to dental school for? Okay. And what do you think the transition was going from was like going from undergrad to dental school i mean it was a lot less fun in dental school a lot more serious so i i i met a lot of good friends but there's just like dental school's very intense experience i wish it was different they make you memorize and study for stuff that you never use again but it's just kind of how it goes so i think that you just want to be prepared for like it kind of does take over your life pretty much you know so it's during the day, studying at night, doing your stuff. So I just would be prepared for that type of environment. I went to Villanova, which was a good like biology, I had a good biology degree. So I felt very comfortable with the classes. I know some people who might have like a literature degree, which I think would have been fun. They struggle a little bit more with all the science classes. Doesn't mean they didn't graduate. Just means that, hey, if you're doing more literature than biology stuff, dental school has more biology and chemistry in it. Just something to be aware of. Yeah. And then did you find that your study habits kind of changed or how did you tend to study for exams? I mean, I think exams are just giant memorization contests in general. So I was kind of geared up to that from my Villanova experience of all the histology, uh, microbiology and things like that. I think if you, if you are in a degree where you do like a lot of writing, which I think is a really awesome life skill, it doesn't often translate into the test taking and dental school skills. So you just might want to be aware that maybe it might take you a little longer to study for stuff than your classmates, but it doesn't mean that that's bad. And then in dental school, how was the environment like? Did you find it to be more competitive or were people more willing to collaborate or what was it like? I, I think dental school creates what I call the dental student hunger game, which I think is terrible and toxic. I think they make you compete over things that are nonsense. I think it's why I created Dental Nachos. I think I have a lot of strong feelings about how toxic and 
not cool the dental school environment is. That being said, I made a lot of cool friends there. So we kind of went through this together. It doesn't mean it's always like that, but I do think the field of dentistry and being a dentist from dental school to working in my office this week, it's a very intense job with a customer facing, your customer facing all the time. So you saw my team member Brielle come in. So I run this entrepreneurial startup called Dental Nachos. Guess how many customers came in today to our company, Janine? Um, a, a large amount. <laughs> well, our dental practice, yes, but zero came in person to Dental Nachos. Oh. So if I can give you guys some insight, when I was a dentist in my office on Monday this week, we might have 20, 30, 40 customers come in and stand next to us and need services. When I run this company, which is essentially a virtual company, so we have six people in office today, but zero customers come in, it's not the same intensity with seeing customers face to face. So when you ask about kind of, what was the original question here? So I can make sure I'm getting the answer right. Uh, so the original question was, essentially the competitive environment. Dentistry is a very intense field. It's an intense field from dental school to being in practice. Now intensity is not bad. It's just that when you're in front of your customer who doesn't really want to be there to get dental work done, you can be inspired and feel rewarded for helping people chew and smile with confidence, which is what we talk about with our patients. They often are not appreciative and do not want to be there and don't want to pay for it. So what I think is important, and I wish my generation talked more about, is your morale when you go into work. So when you go into work, are you the type of person that would like to make a really good living, because dentists make good livings, but kind of have your customers not want to be there? Or would you rather run a cupcake place where the customers love it, but you might have to get up at four in the morning to make the cupcakes? So what I think you guys should be thinking about, whether you're watching this live or in person, is what is your type of personality because this is a 30 year career and there's people who love dentistry. There's people who like dentistry. There's people who think it's okay. And then there's sadly people who never should have chosen it. Try to make sure you're the person who shouldn't have chosen it because it's a, it's a long career if that happens. And the best way to make sure it is do as much research as possible talking to dentists now before you apply. Good idea. And then again, related to dental school, can you, if you like happen to remember, can you describe like what each year was typically like, like the hallmarks of each year? Yeah, I mean, every school is a little different and they, they do different. So I can only speak about Penn exactly, but first year was a lot of uh, science classes and work with like models in the pre-clinic. Uh, I had struggled with some of the like prepping of the teeth and the waxing of the teeth, it's very artistic, it wasn't exactly the, easy for me. So that was stress for me, second year, was uh, more classes and more of the work in the pre-clinic, working on models and plastic teeth, and now you guys have computerized teeth. Third and fourth year, we're working in the clinic, doing oral surgery rotations, seeing your patients. So the first two years, you don't see a lot of patients. My school didn't. The second two years is a lot, of, you're kind of like a pretend dentist in the clinic getting supervised. Some of that's more fun, but some of it's totally unfair to the dental student. So like, if you were a pretend restaurant owner and you had to make the food, clean up after the food, take the orders, do all of those things, it could be very stressful. So I think the, cl the clinic environment is more why you're there to learn to be a dentist. But go on Dental Nacho's Facebook group, go on Instagram, follow people there, and ask them about their dental school experience because maybe you'll find one that's the right fit for you. Penn might not be reflective of all different dental schools. Some I know, Gene, they start doing patient care year one. I think that sounds great. And did you have a year that you preferred more than another? D three year was the best year because you're in the clinic, you're not finishing yet, you're out of the pre-clinic stuff. So that was my favorite. And so you kind of mentioned that you found that science classes helped out a lot during dental school. Do you have like any specific types of classes that you think prepared you the most? I mean, all the biology, biochem, because I mean, we did kind of the same thing again. So it's like if you were learning, if I was if, if I was going to go to you know a foreign language school like speaking Spanish, and my college taught me some Spanish, but well, when I got to grad level Spanish, I would have a foundation of knowing how to teach Spanish. I mean, to speak Spanish, biology, chemistry, microbiology, those are things that were helpful to me. Doesn't mean you can't do it if you don't take those. It just made it a little bit easier for me. 
Awesome. And did you participate in any organizations during dental school? Any extracurriculars during that time as well? That's a good question. I, I know I did. Like, I like sports, so I played on, like, our dental school basketball teams. I would always try to be involved in some of the ASDA type things, but I wasn't, like, a leader in that. But I know that there's some really good opportunities to be involved in ASDA. And now they have – I mean, the world – has made a lot of improvements. So we didn't have as many clubs that emphasize diversity, which I think is awesome. So I'm sure if they had that when I was there, I probably would have wanted to be involved with in some of those things. Doesn't mean they didn't have any, but I have a feeling that in dental schools now, there's all different types of clubs on, whether it's diversity as a person, diversity as a professional, maybe it was a little boring back in 2002, but I did do like sports and as the stuff. Oh. And did you ever happen to do a, some study abroad, whether it was an undergrad or dental school? I did not do that. I was kind of jealous, but I did not do that. Okay. And so you mentioned that you didn't do a residency program. What made you decide to um, stick to with general? Um, I, my dad was a general dentist. I did do a general practice residency. So I showed oh, yeah. a general PR, a GPR and AGD. I love that. I got to learn about implants. They did a multiple year one. But I did it because my dad was a general dentist, and I thought, like, oh, I'd like to do a bunch of different things. 20 years later, I wish I did perio. That was what I would have liked to have done. I mean, I love working with my dad. He passed away a few years ago. But I think if I was to go again and had to be a dentist, I would become a periodontist oral surgeon, my favorite periodontist. They do fewer procedures. They get paid better for their procedures. And they don't have to manage as many things for patients. Oh, I see. So did you learn about that by – Having connections with other periodontists or what? Yeah, great question. I mean, I have, we have periodontists work in our office, so I bring specialists mm -hmm. in to work on our patients. So I can explain, like, what's your favorite, right? What's your favorite type of food to go out and eat? To me? I'd say probably Mexican food. Yeah, I love Mexican too. So when you go to a Mexican restaurant, imagine you went to a Mexican restaurant, you're sitting there with four friends, and someone's like, I'll have tacos, I'll have nachos, I'll have the burrito. And the fourth person goes, I'll have a hamburger. The Mexican place, like, you can get out. We don't make that there, right? But then if you go to a diner, right, whether you go to a diner or a brunch place, they make, like, 15, 20 different things. Mexican restaurants that make Mexican food, Italian restaurants, Italian food, sushi restaurants, sushi. We get all this in Philadelphia. It's very specific and specialized. But then we've all been to diners and bar and grills where they try to make 25 different things, and they make it okay, pretty good, but not as good as the specialty places. So my brain would have been better doing fewer things well than a bunch of things good. Yeah, that makes sense. And so once you graduated dental school, what was it, can you describe that transition from dental school to actually working as a dentist? Yeah, sure. So I did, I really highly recommend a GPR, AGD. You get to work in a hospital environment or, or a clinic type environment. You don't have the financial pressures. But then I joined my dad in practice as an associate. So going from a learning to a business environment is an adjustment because you have to be focused on seeing enough patients, still doing great work, managing people's expectations, working with the team. So it's like when you're in college, like you don't have to think about paying your rent in college the same way you do in the real world. So in the business world, when you go from a grad school where everything's taken care of behind the scenes financially for your patients in dental school, to you have to worry if your patients pay or you don't get paid, that adjustment of learning business skills. If you're sitting here watching and you're saying, hey, I want to do another thing. So one, how to speak by Patrick Winston. Watch it. It's phenomenal. Number two, start listening to podcasts on communication. Toastmasters. I'm a big fan of Gary Vee. He does curse a lot. I'm a big fan of Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, Entrepreneurs on fire. Communication skills. How you learn to talk to people is everything your team, other dentists, your patients, that was the biggest adjustment, having to talk to so many different people each day. How did you learn about the business aspect of dentistry? Was it just being put into that environment or did you take some type of course or something similar? I mean, what I did when during my residency, I went to all as many C courses as possible. One of my mentors said, for every clinical CA where you learn how to work on teeth, take one on business or practice management. So I took courses on leadership, team development, how money works in a dental office. I have a huge platform that I created called Dental Nacho Flicks where people can watch this on their phone. So there's so much content out there. You just have to find out which one. If any of you guys want any business communication, leadership context, 
content, please text me. I can give you the text number. It's not my real phone number. It's my text hotline. And we'll text you back courses you can watch as a pre dental student. That would be awesome to learn about the industry. One is called Lies, Loans, and Life After Dental School. So if you want me to share in the chat later, you know, I can text yeah. you guys how to get that. Mm -hmm. It's a very, um, it's a great course because here's the thing. When you go to dental school or medical school or law school and your friends are all working in the real world and you're in the fake world and then you go to sign your first contract, many times people will try to take advantage of you and ask you to sign contracts not in your favor. So I created a whole course for dental students to watch. And if you see this in the contract, it's a red flag. One of the biggest pain points is new dentist signing bad contracts. Okay. And then earlier you mentioned um, general practice residencies. Can you kind of explain the difference between the two? Uh, general practice residency or advanced education, general dentistry, GPRs, general practice, they're usually hospital based. AGDs are non hospital based, usually earn between forty to $60,000 a year. So you are paid, but you obviously make more in the real world. But the best part about it is you get to practice skills like implants, extraction, suturing in a supportive environment. Highly recommend you do it. I'm sure you guys have friends who are going to medical school. They have to do three, four, five, six, seven, eight year residencies, spend one year doing an AGD or GPR. will be one of the best experiences you will ever invest in yourself because you get to practice on people with people helping you. And it's very hard to do that in private practice. Yeah, that makes sense, getting a lot more experience before actually going in to practice. Yeah, for sure. And then how long did it take you to become comfortable um, working on your own? Or you mentioned uh, that you were also working with um, others as well. Yeah, I mean, I like having other dentists in the office. I mean, things can go, things can be challenging no matter how long you've been a dentist. But I think those first zero to four years out of school are a big learning process. So put yourself in environments where you can ask questions to other people. So we had a baby in 2014. You wanna know what's crazy? You go to the hospital with two people, me and my wife, you leave with a third person, Janine, they don't ask you any questions. There's no books, there's no manuals. They just say, go home with your baby. It's nuts, right? So when you go home with your baby, freaking grandparents come over and babysitters, and people wanna help you with your baby. But nobody wants to help you with your dental career. So you better find some dentist who want to support you. So I'd say zero to four years is a huge time to get comfortable. So definitely the GPR AGD I recommend. And then when you get a job, get it with supportive people who have your back while you're there. We have a new dentist working with us. She knows she can text or call my brother and I, my brother and I are with her. We have, we help support her. That is gold when you can have another dentist on site who has your back. And then how many dental positions have you had? You mentioned that you started as an associate. Um, what has it, and you have like your practice or how? Well, I went into my dad's practice and worked with him. So I've only had work there. Most us new dentists will have four to six associate positions, three to six associate positions. It kind of shows you how often stuff doesn't work out. So I think, I mean, imagine, so associates are a little bit like babysitters of the practice. We have babysitters in our home for our seven and three year old. I love our babysitters. I try to treat them as nicely as possible. So they come back and babysit my crazy kids. So imagine if I hired you as a babysitter, Jean, I was like, hey, I don't want you to work for any other families. I only want you to work for me three nights a week and I'll pay you a hundred bucks a night. And what if after the first week I go, oh, Jean, I don't need you another night. Or, oh, Jean, there's not enough hours. So many times dentists will hire dentists not knowing they don't really need them, which messes up your ability to work elsewhere. So associates don't, associateships don't work out for many reasons, but often it's because the practice isn't busy enough to support one. And then now talking more about cases, what has been your most difficult case? I mean, a lot of the Big, big cases where you're reviewing someone's entire smile, entire mouth, they need to have all their teeth removed and have implants. Those can be really challenging to become with a lot of risk and a lot of reward. So knowing how to troubleshoot big picture things. So if I said, you're going to make dinner for five people, Janine, you're like, okay, I can do that. You're going to make dinner for 50 people. Oh, geez, it's 50 people and it's all their wedding anniversaries. That would be an intense dinner to make, right? So 
challenging cases is when how big of an impact it has on the patient's life and what their expectations are. So it can be very rewarding, but if you're not comfortable or skillful enough to do it, it can be difficult. And that's why you need people on your team. And I've had challenges with wrong shade of teeth, challenging patients not happy. And that's a normal part of working patient facing or customer facing. I can share something, maybe this will help someone listening now. This is not something you're gonna find in a book. It's not something you're gonna find talking to a bunch of dentists. Maybe some, but I'm a little bit, my grandmother said I was very special, Janine, so I feel like I'm special. I have a whole nother life running an entrepreneurial based company with dental nachos. Then I have this dentist life. So for the past four years, I've been able to work as a dentist part of the time and as an entrepreneur part of the time. There's crazy stresses with both, but I want to share with you. If you work in a dental office as a dentist, you have to make customer after customer after customer after customer after customer after customer after customer customer not upset every day. And it's not easy to do. Over here at Del Nachos, it's different, right? If you're an accountant and you help 30 clients, dentists can have 3,000 patients. So I just want you to, no one's probably ever really gonna explain this to you the way I do. Having many, many customers expecting you to make them happy is a challenge. Doesn't mean run away from dentistry, doesn't mean don't do it, just really put the time into understanding that's what this field is like. It goes fast your day, you get to help people, it can be financially rewarding, but there is a tremendous amount of pressure on making people happy every day that you barely know. And when it does come to those difficult cases, do you usually just ask other the other dentists in your office for advice? Or you mentioned like when there's issues in shade matching, do you ask other people um, if like the shade, they, they think that the yeah, shade matches? Yeah, I'm patient, my team. I'll ask online too. I'll ask online, I'll ask my team. I'll ask other dentists. I try to pull my resources. One of the things too is like, you guys all know this feeling. So you guys are probably young and into great stuff. And let's say you all are into fundraisers. Let's say your friend always asks you to donate to their fundraiser, even 20 bucks. Or let's say your friend asks you to show up to hand out like meals for people, but they never show up to your fundraiser. They just want something from you and they're not investing back in you. So when you ask someone for help, whether it's online or in person, be the friendly resource to help them at other times. Because if people only want from you, you all know this, you got a friend like this, you got a sister like this, you got a parent like this. They only come to you when they have a problem and they're not there for you when you have a problem. Make sure you do both. And then what procedure do you work on most often? For me, dental implants, because that's what I like focusing on. But general dentists do a lot with crowns, fillings, rebuilding teeth. Periodontists do things with implants, gum tissue, oral surgeons attract teeth, endodontists do root canals, pediatric dentists work on kids, orthodontists straighten teeth. And do you have like a procedure that is like your favorite or one that is your least favorite or how do you? Implants are my favorite. My least favorite is uh, doing root canals myself, Mm -hmm. but I haven't done them for a while. Um, One of the things too though is, if your most favorite procedure doesn't bring in a lot of money, it can't be your only most favorite procedure because if you own a restaurant and you really love making French fries, that's not going to make the restaurant survive. So you do have to look at procedures as a way to help patients first, but also be profitable to practice second. Cause as the dentist, you have to make sure the practice make, makes enough money to bring in, to pay everybody, pay your supplies, pay your team. These are the things they should talk more about in dental school. And then when you do have um, those procedures, such as like a root canal, do you tend to like refer them out or do you yeah. have the other dentists in your practice? Work? Combination. If I have someone there, they might do it. If not, I'll just refer them out of the office. Really good question. Okay. And have you had a case that has been impactful for you? Like a, I mean, one, one, yeah. I mean, one patient hadn't seen a dentist for 30 years. I was 28 years old when I met him. So he hadn't seen a dentist for since longer than I've been alive. He needed all his teeth removed, replaced him with dental implants. His wife said that we helped save his life, got his confidence back. So I'm having a bad day. I remember that patient, Mark. If anybody wants to see that story, I can text you. Uh, we did a whole course on him. So there are amazingly transformative things that you get to do as dentists. And 
rebuilding Mark's home out as part of it. And for your office, do you have any technology that has like really helped like expedite your process or anything yeah. similar? Main one for us is something called a CBCT. It's a three-dimensional x-ray machine that helps you see how much bone people have or any challenges or problems they have in their mouth. Um, there's other things. We don't have this in our office, but people can actually make crowns in their office with um, mills and scanners. If you like a lot of tech, if you like a lot of video games, dentistry can really be for you because there's a big video game component to it. Okay. And then um, are you part of any organizations of the dentist or do you do anything like volunteering? I know you mentioned that you have your own um, dental nachos. Yeah, do you have I mean, I'm a member of the ADA. They have some problems. I'm a member of the ADA. I also do donated dental care. So there's uh, offices can sign up to do free cases on patients that need it. So we don't charge them anything. And they come to your office. I'm, I'm really like that. And I mean, I run a lot of in-person events for dentists to come to, dental students to come to in Philadelphia, and then also virtually online. And when it comes to like your home life, how do you find that work and home life balance and how do you best manage that? It's very difficult. We should talk more about that to young people. Mm -hmm. So I, I wrote a email once as being successful too stressful because a 38 year old female dentist who I was friends with, who I'm friends with, who's a practice owner was like, listen, Paul, I probably make $400,000 a year. I have a family, I have a practice, I have a husband and I'm very stressed because when I go home, I think about the office, I worry about this, I do this. So I think that mental health is really important. Um, trying to figure out how to manage your stress as a leader is important. And it's something I strive to figure out. I use resources like podcasts. I've done a lot of coaching. I've invested in coaching for myself on leadership. It's a huge challenge that people have whether you're 24 to 54. But when you run a customer facing business, it will impact your personal life, whether people have emergencies, whether your team is canceling. I mean, I'm sorry, whether your team needs to call out the next day. So letting your family know that I'm gonna to have to do some stuff for my business while I'm at home is essential. And then can you describe like what a typical day like is like at your practice? Yeah, I mean, uh, we have a morning huddle for the team at like 8.15, first patient's at nine o'clock. The pandemic has, we've shortened some of our hours. I don't like to work at nights. So we have like nine to one patient care. We have hygienists, we do our uh, crowns, implants. We have lunch one to two. Um, this afternoon might be two to four, two to six. We don't work on Saturdays right now, but there's many different business models. Some people work eight to eight. Some people work every single Saturday. Dentistry does have the ability to work part-time too. Uh, if this might help somebody. So I have two children. Currently, and their daughters, my daughters are awesome, but women have babies. And what does that mean? When you have a baby, like my wife had, it, you can't go back to work the next day. So you usually take a maternity leave, three to four months. And then when you come back from maternity leave and you're a mom, it's a hard balance. It's often they, the moms want to work part time. If you want to work part time, Wednesdays and Thursdays only, and be with your family the rest of the time. Being a specialist allows you to work part-time better than a general dentist. So when you just do root canals, you just do perio, you can work two days a week for a general dentist and not own a place. One of the biggest challenges is, and not impossible, because I have tons of amazing women on dental nachos who are practice owners, moms, doing it all. That moment when you have a young family, especially right after having a baby, it's very difficult to run a practice, have an infant, keep your sanity. When I say difficult, I don't mean impossible. When I say difficult, I don't mean that there's no resources. I'm a big fan of Gary Vaynerchuk. Self-awareness is key. If you're the type of person who thinks you love all that chaos, do it. If you're the type of person who don't think you're gonna love all that chaos, figure out a strategy for you that will make you successful. Cool. And then you were kind of talking about like um, the different schedules, but how much does your, do you work a week? Like I mean, practice or at your... When I was working full time as a practice owner, I, dentists often work 26 to 34 patient hours, but then they have a lot of business hours after it. So dentists can easily work 50 or 60 hours a week, but maybe only 25 to 35 at the chair. So one of the nice parts about dentistry is you can leave the patient care at the office because patients don't follow you home to your house and sit at your kitchen table with you. 
Um, but there's often business things, payroll, managing the team that come afterwards. So I think most dentists are working 30 ish patient hours, but they're probably doing 10 to 20 more hours a week working on the business. Yeah, that makes sense. And then can you describe the continuing education aspect of being a dentist or how you stay up to date with like yeah, technology sure. changes? One of the cool parts about dentistry is that it's always changing. One of the challenging parts is that it's always changing. So keeping up with implants, sleep apnea, cosmetic stuff, I've created a huge C platform for dental nachos where people can learn from their phone. One of the things you guys have is, you know, I can be at the gym literally listening to a C course. I can be learning at any time. So in-person learning and online learning it's a fun part about being a dentist, but imagine if like, you know how like cell phones change all the time from iPhone 10 to 11 to 12 to 13. Some of that's cool. But when you get that new iPhone 13, you're like, I don't know how the buttons work. I don't know how this works. Some of those challenges of figuring it out are fun, but also stressful. So dentistry with its constant change, you want to be a lifelong learner and want some of those changes or else you're not going to like the field very much. And then we're almost done here, but what has been your favorite part of being a dentist? Favorite part, developing relationships with people. My team, my patients, uh, you want to, they become like friends. I get to have impacts on their lives. I get to grow with them. That is my favorite part of being a dentist. That people have left better after seeing me, whether it's with their smile, whether it's with their confidence, whether it's them as a person, that you get to have an awesome impact on many people who don't feel good when they smile, who don't feel good with their teeth. There's a, if you guys want to be dentists, do this. Google Malcolm Gladwell, the New Yorker, the moral hazard myth. So Google the moral hazard myth by Malcolm Gladwell. He went around the country with Harvard researchers asking people if they could change one thing about their life. These are people who didn't have any insurance. These are people who had financial problems. What would they change? And they picked their teeth because teeth is a marker of self-esteem. Teeth is a marker. Can you get a job? So one of the cool parts about it is you get to transform people's lives in an amazing way. And then our last question um, is, I know you've given like a lot of advice and recommendations, but do you have any other things you want to share, um, whether it be like advice, recommendations, or just any other resources that you may have? So it's awesome to listen and learn and think, but it's better to do. So Gary Vee says, you can't learn about push-ups by reading about them, you have to do push-ups. So my inspiration is just do one thing. Listen to Patrick Winston, how to speak. Start listening to podcasts on communication. If you write this down, you can text the word LIES, L-I-E-S, 215-543-6454. If you text that word in, you'll get a course on how to pay off dental school debt, how to not get taken advantage of your contract, how to communicate with patients. So I think what you guys are doing, Jeannie, is amazing. But I know high level people. I know smart people. I am one. We love to read. We love to think. We love it, but we have to do. So my advice is just go do something. Do one thing to improve yourself. Do one thing to learn. Contact a dentist to observe. Make yourself a checklist and each week do one of those things. That's the best advice I could give. Thank you so much. Well, those are our last questions. This has been super um, informative and we're very grateful that you can come here and speak with us. Um, yeah, and thank you everyone who was able to come and join us um, on our shadowing session. But yeah, we can end the session here. And again, thank you so much. Awesome, thanks. If you guys need any more people to come on like this, just ask me. I have like many friends who can help you. Oh, for sure, yeah. That's nice.